So um, thanks very much, very much uh, for uh, inviting me to be able to do this. It's really great to this uh, seminar series. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about uh, modeling all of the 437 catalytically competent human kinases in the active form and, and doing the structural bioinformatics um, that you need to be able to accomplish that. Um, so in humans, there are 494 typical kinases. And by typical kinases, we mean basically the same as the PKA domain with an N-terminal domain with some beta sheet strands and the C-helix, C-terminal domain of all alpha helices. Um, the activation loop is what I'm following with my uh, cursor right now. Um, begins with the DFG motif um, and ends with a motif that's APE, sort of uh, alanine, proline, uh, glutamic acid. Um, and then the catalytic loop is in the middle and the substrate binds kind of across here. Um, of these 494 typical kinases, only 437 of them are catalytic. Um, the other 57 are pseudokinases, meaning they have mutations in one of the active site residues that make them an inactive uh, uh, kinase. Um, and so we're interested in modeling the active form of these 437. The pseudokinases have sometimes have an active form or they look like active kinases, but also they look like inactive kinases. Um, and we're excluding, you know, PI3, PI4 kinases, ABC kind of those other, you know, kinase families, but we're excluding those. Um, if we look at the protein data bank, um, we can, we have a website called uh, Kin4 um, with this address. Um, and what we want to do is look at the active forms of kinases. They should be able to bind ATP, magnesium ions, um, and substrate. And we want active models, and as well as inactive models, but for the active models, um, we want to un understand uh, substrate specificity, and so you need to know what the active structure looks like, what the substrate binding form looks like. We want to know the differences between active and inactive conformations of each kinase. Um, we want to be able to understand the regulation of kinases, what makes a kinase active, phosphorylation, or binding other partners, um, the drugability of the active form of the kinase, and the effect of mutations on kinase activity. So a mutation might make the inactive state uh, less stable, it might make the active state more stable. And so we need to know both the active and the inactive form. And so we want to know, can we make alpha fold, make models of all of these kinases in their active form? Um, what does an active kinase look like anyway? And how many of them are there in the PDB? Um, and the way we did that is to look at substrate bound structures and ATP bound structures um, in the PDB to get a good idea of what active structures look like. Um, and so, uh, oops, I just want to close this little link. Hold on a second. Okay, there we go. Um, what makes a kinase structure active? And what we did is we looked at 40 unique substrate bound structures in the PDB, that is different kinases and or different substrates. Um, and here are pictures of those from the AGC kinase family, the CMGC kinase family, CAMK, and tyrosine kinases. Um, and they all have some kind of common features. Um, one is so the activation loop here is in magenta. It always you know, starts here at the DFG motif and extends to the right, we always look at kinases with the N-terminal domain at the top and the C-terminal domain at the bottom. Um, so it always goes all the way over to the right and then comes back um, below. Um, and the substrate here is in dark blue and is kind of across the, is in the middle of the activation loop, the top part of it and the bottom part of it. Um, the DFG motif is up here, that's in orange. Um, and I've marked a couple of other residues that I'll talk about later. These are phosphorylated residues here in pink. Um, and there's one shape that's very interesting is this sort of, upside down bottom boat um, that you see in AGC kinase, you see in all serine threonine kinases. It's a little different in tyrosine kinases, um, but it's the same, you know, it's, that is the same as this shape here and this shape here, if you can follow my mouse. Um, it's different in tyrosine kinases where the position of the substrate is actually different. The, the substrate binds to the C-terminal part of the activation loop, whereas in, this, in the serine threonine kinases, most kinases, um, it's kind of in the middle of the activation loop. Um, here are just some statistics. This, these 40 structures include some autophosphorylation structures. Those are structures in the PDB where the active, where a autophosphorylation site of one kinase, like a serine three or tyrosine, is sitting in the active site of another kinase in the same crystal, in, in the same, you know, the same kinase type. Um, and, and that site is an autophosphorylation site, a known autophosphorylation site. And we did a study um, of those um, eight years ago, um, published in Science Signaling. So that includes some of these, these photo. 40 structures includes that set. Um, if we look at these 40 structures and we also look at ATP bound structures, the first thing we notice um, is the position of the phenylalanine and the, the aspartic acid of the, of the DFG motif. Um, and so if we look here on the lower left, this is the phenylalanine of the DFG motif. And we can see 
that they're basically three clusters of positions. Some of them are underneath the C-helix. Um, some of them are out of that pocket altogether and way over here in magenta. Um, and then some of them are in between. And so these um, cyan ones are DFG in. They're in um, the aspartic acid would actually be right where the, the these purple um, phenylalanines are um, and would be in the active site. And the phenylalanines are in this pocket underneath the C-helix. Um, the magenta ones are called DFG out. That is the aspartic acid has been flipped out of this position and the phenylalanine has replaced it. And a few years ago, we did clustering of all of the conformations of kinases in the PDB. Um, and we used a couple of distances to define what was DFG out, what was DFG intermediate, we call this intermediate set, um, and DFG in. And those two distances are to the lyse, there's a lysine uh, glutamic acid salt bridge in the N terminal domain. Um, so one of the distances is to the lysine C alpha. Um, and the other distance is to a residue that's four, four positions after the glutamic acid of this salt bridge. So we call it glue plus four. Um, and if we look at you know, all the structures in the PDB that do not have ATP, um, you see a really broad distribution. These blue ones are the DFG in structures. They're the ones that the phenylalanine is very close to this methionine here, this glue plus four residue, um, and far away from the lysine. Um, and if we look at only the ATP structures, they are almost all DFG in. So they're, that, they're this you know, kind of position where the phenylalanine is here. Um, these green ones are DFG out. That includes type two inhibitor bound structures um, are the green ones over here. Um, if we look at the dihedral angles that position that phenylalanine, as well as the, the, the X, the D, and the residue before the phenylalanine, uh, before the DFG motif, the, the D, the F, and the G, um, these are what the dihedrals look like of the 40 structures that um, uh, have substrate bound, these 40 unique structures. Um, and they follow the same pattern, all of them. So the, the residue before the DFG, if we call it X, um, is in the beta position of the Ramachandra map. Um, the aspartic acid itself is in the left-handed part of the left-handed helix part of the um, Ramachandra map. Proteins don't actually have left-handed helices, but, um, but it would be in this left-handed side. Um, the phenylalanine is in the alpha region, and so is the glycine, but actually slightly different positions. Um, and then if we look at the dihedral angles of the side chains, the aspartic acid is, um, has a trans chi-1 dihedral and a zero degree chi-2 dihedral. And the phenyl phenylalanine has a G minus uh, chi-1 dihedral and about 90 degrees uh, for chi-2 as it usually does. And so we call this conformation BLA minus, and that's after the X residue is in the beta, the ASP is in the left, and the um, phenylalanine is in the A region. And the dihedral angle, the chi-1 rotomer of the phenylalanine is minus. So that's BLA minus. Um, I'll show you in a second why we didn't cluster on the, on the, on the uh, glycine. So if we take all the structures in the PDB and we cluster based on just those, that set of dihedral angles, um, so excluding the glycine, um, we get this following set of clusters. We get eight clusters. Um, six of them are DFG in. And so we're going to name them again after the regions of the Ramachandra map. So this is B, this is L, this is A, and the color represents the minus dihedral of the phenylalanine. Um, if we look at some um, inactive states, one very common one is sometimes called SARC inactive. Um, it's this one where my, my mouse is hovering, um, and it is B, L, B, and it's a plus dihedral. And in that plus dihedral, the phenylalanine kind of points upwards pushes the C helix out, it's an inactive conformation of the kinase. Um, and you can see that the glycine actually, in, you know, for some of these clusters, there are several different glycine conformations. And so we excluded the glycine because if you include it, you end up with about 30 different clusters instead of eight, and it's really sort of too many. Um, but these are the active structures. These are the ones that have ATP bound, they have substrate bound, or the B, L, A, and the minus. Um, DFG out ones are B, B, A, and minus is a common conformation for type two inhibitor bound structures. So this is stuff we published a few years ago in PNAS. Um, the next, the third, so we have DFG in, we have BLA minus. The third criterion for active structures is a well-known feature of, of active structures is a salt bridge in the N terminal domain that I mentioned earlier. And so it's a lysine in the beta three strand. It's a glutamic acid in the C helix and they make a salt bridge that helps to chelate uh, magnesium ions as well as, the, as well as the ATP. And so this is from some of the substrate bound structures. This, um, and if we look across all these structures, there's a, you know, there's a very good hydrogen bond distance between these, these two residues. So that's our third criterion. 
But the the sort of two new crime, I mean, those are those three are pretty are well known at this point. Um, the next two are ones that we we came to by looking at all these substrate bound structures. So if we look at all the substrate bound structures, we can look to see what are the contacts of the substrate um, with the activation loop. Um, and so this is not all 40 of them, but this is a selection of them. Um, most of them have ATP bound and magnesium. If we look at DFG XXX, um, the, the residues in red are ones with contacts um, of that residue with the substrate. So generally residue four, sometimes residue six, sometimes some of the DFG residues. And if we look at 789, I don't have them printed here, but 789 do not have contacts with the substrate. It's really only up through residue six. If we look from at the C-terminal part, so the C-terminal motif is usually APE or SPE or PPE, something like that, um, are the last three residues of the activation loop. The residues that have contacts with the substrate go back to, you know, this is residue 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, so they go about as far as residue 13, maybe a couple, a little bit further, um, but definitely in the region of eight, nine, 10, you know, those residues all, all almost all substrate bound structures have contacts with sort of eight, nine, 10. Is, uh, 10 and 11. Um, and so we wanted to see, well, what are the you know positions of those residues that we could, you know, what could we use to, what would that tell us about um, you know, the structures of active kinases? Um, and so the first thing we looked at was um, the N-terminal part of it. And if we look at residues, this is DFGXX, so residue five, two, two residues after the DFG, so one, two, three, four, five, and then residue six and residue seven, there is a well-known um, hydrogen bond. It's actually a very small beta sheet of a couple of residues um, with the XHRD motif. The HRD motif is the act is in the catalytic loop. It's the aspartic acid of the, X, the HRD motif makes a hydrogen bond with the substrate, with the substrate OH of the serine, threonine, or tyrosine. Um, and so in all of these um, substrate bound structures, there are hydrogen bonds between DFG6 and the residue before the HRD. So this is two residues before HID, HRD, one residue before HRD in green, and then the HRD, and this is the, the histidine of the HRD. Um, so it's the, the residue in the sequence just before the HRD. Um, and so that's a very common hydrogen bond. The distances are all you know, around three angstroms. So we set a cutoff of 3.6, just to be a little generous. But the other part of the activation loop is, it turned out to be really interesting. If we look at some structures of, of you know, some well-known kinases, um, if we look at Aurora, um, if you look at the, the structures that, uh, that are ATP bound um, of Aurora or N phosphorylated, they come in two flavors, conformation one, we call them conformation one and conformation two. Um, conformation one um, has the upside down boat, the, the whole activation loop goes out that way, but conformation two um, has this kind of double hump um, confirmation at the C terminus, and, and it is blocking, actually blocking the activate uh, the active site or the where the substrate would bind. Um, so these are two very different confirmations, but they are all DFG in. They are all BLA minus. Um, they all have the salt bridge, and so and they all have that N terminal uh, hydrogen bond that I just showed you in the previous um, slide. So we need another criterion to distinguish between these two sets. Um, and if we superpose those on structures that have um, substrates bound, um, it's clear that, so one of these is the Aurora structure um, that, that is confirmation one here, um, and several other ones are the, are the substrate bound ones. The, um, it's clear that confirmation one is the substrate binding confirmation, whereas confirmation two, if I put the substrates in of some structures, there is a big steric conflict between this sort of light blue or sort of silvery um, activation loop and the substrates of, of kinases in the same family. Um, and so we need a criterion to distinguish between confirmation one and confirmation two. Um, and oh, by the way, the, the active structures are bound, have TPX2 bound. And basically TPX2 kind of pulls on the activation loop and makes it active. In the absence of TPX2, um, it's a little bit like a slinky. Um, the activation loop is kind of bunched up um, and inactive. Um, and so the criterion that we came to was looking at the ninth residue back um, from the end of the activation loop. So if we count APE and then count six more residues, um, that just, there is a very short distance between the C alpha of that residue um, and the carbonyl oxygen of the R of the HRD. Um, and so it's sort of, it, it's, it's a, um, a kind of a theme that our N-terminal uh, 
criterion and our C-terminal criterion are both interactions of the activation loop with the HRD motif, with residues within the HRD motif, which makes a lot of sense because that's a conserved part of the structure, it's part of the active site, and helps to anchor the activation loop in the active form. Um, and so that distance is very short in active kinases, in substrate bound kinases, um, but it's quite long. Here's our confirmation two of Aurora, and that distance is 10 angstroms. Um, and so we set a cutoff of six angstroms just based on the statistics um, that, that this distance should be fairly short. Um, and then here it is in, in a lot of the substrate bound structures of that, that C alpha to carbonyl oxygen distance. Um, and so now we have five criteria, just to summarize. Um, DFG in, BLA minus, the salt bridge, the activation loop N terminal, and the activation loop C terminal. Now what happens in the PDB, there are 437 human kinases that are act catalytic. Um, 268 of them are in the PDB altogether. Um, 202 are BLA minus. Um, 188 are BLA minus and have the salt bridge. 193 have the BLA minus and the activation loop N terminal. I um, mean, there's a big drop when you start to look at the C-terminal. That C-terminal criterion actually eliminates 30 kinases. Um, and so if we use all five criteria, um, 155 of our 437 are active in the PDB, or 36%. Um, if we look for the entire activation loop, we want to make sure that, the, that it has full coordinates. Um, it's down to 130, um, so only 30%. And so we'd like to make models of the rest of them. And so we did what a lot of people have been doing. Nothing is particularly unique here. Um, is that we've used, you know, uh, multiple sequence alignments for um, alpha fold two that are shallow, 10, 20, 30 sequences. Um, and then we've, we've selected templates that are specifically active, that have these criteria that I've just laid out. Um, and so we used orthologs of each query, of each kinase, that is kinases in Uniprobe that were more than 50% sequence identical, that had high coverage, um, and that were less than 90% identical to each other. So we clustered them and picked one from each. Um, we also used all the kinases in the human uh, uh, proteome um, as another set of sequences, and then we also used Uniprep. And we did, you know, different numbers of, of sequences in the multiple sequence alignment, from five all the way up to 90 um, for the shallow sequence alignments, and then for Uniprep, we used 10,000. The template databases we used were, we used these active structures in the PDB, the, um, including non-human kinases, and so there was a total of 165. Um, and then we used what we call distillation templates, that is, Early on, we made models with AlphaFold that were active. They passed all our criteria. And then we also used those as templates to make additional models. Um, and here are two citations, people that had done you know, similar work on GPCRs or in kinases, uh, you know, these shallow sequence alignments and specific templates. Um, this is what happens if, if, let's just look at the ortholog set here on the right. Um, if we, uh, the, 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 the y-axis is the number of active kinases out of 437. And as the MSA depth gets lower from 100 kinases all the way down to, to one or two um, sequences in the multiple sequence alignment, the number of kinases, the number of kinases for which we get at least one active model rises. Um, and, and these are the two different template sets in the blue and, and uh, in magenta. Um, if we look at the EBI website, there's only 209 active kinases in that set, um, EBI's models. Um, if we use five models, you know, uh, AlphaFold is five models, with all of Unipro and with PDB70, um, you only get 308. So by doing this, we managed to get all 437 of them active. What happens is that not any one set of uh, MSA and templates makes all 437 active. You have to combine the results across all of the different uh, MSA depths and template sets um, in order to get them all to be active. Um, and so we managed to get them all active. We actually had to make a mutation in one of them. It's possible it's a pseudokinase, we're not sure. Um, but here's, you know, here are uh, sets of these of the structures. Um, so here's 51 AGC kinases. You can see the upside down bottom boat. Um, same thing for CGMC kinases. And then tyrosine kinases, that activation loop is really quite diverse on the C-terminal end. Um, we pick the best model, the one that we actually put on our website, by using the PLDDT of the activation loop itself. We use the one with the best minimum PLDDT um, across the activation loop residues. And so here's a plot of AKT1 with the um, activation. So these are all different models that we made. Here's the act, uh, PLDDT of the activation loop um, and the RMSD to a, a known structure that has a substrate bound. And so you can tell that, you know, at lower PLDDT, you do get some diversity of the activation loop. 
um, but the high PLDD, the highest PLDD2 structures correlate with the lowest RMSD. That one. Um, if we look at all 130 of those kinases that have complete activation loops in the PDB in the active form, um, this is our RMSD distribution. So 80% of our models of this 130, we have a model that is better than one angstrom RMSD to that structure. Um, there's a few out here, and we looked at a lot of these. Some of them, we think the PDB structure is not fully active. That is, there's some position of parts of the activation, outer parts of the activation loop that are actually blocking the active site. Um, and so we think our model, most of our models are pretty good. Um, so, so let me skip that. Um, I just want to summarize. Um, these are the criteria that we used for um, uh, active structures in the PD, both, both in the PDB and for uh, the models that we got out of AlphaFold. Um, only one third of the of our 437 kinases are active in the PDB, and now we have models that I think are pretty good of all 437 um, in the active form. Um, inactive structures are actually a lot more complicated. Um, there are some kinases that have really dominant inactive forms that we would like to get AlphaFold to reproduce those inactive forms. Um, other kinases have really broad distributions of inactive structures, and it's not clear what it means to, to try to get the inactive form. They may not have, a, well, they may likely not to have um, a single inactive form, but that's actually a very complicated. You can make a DFG out structure. You can get AlphaFold to make any of the forms of kinases, but are those really the dominant ones that you would see inside cells? Or are they ones that are just picked out by weird inhibitors or they're just part of the landscape? It's, it's really actually a really difficult problem and people have been approaching it, um, but I think, I don't think we have an answer to that yet. Um, and then finally, everything is on our website um, on, on that page. Um, and I want to thank Bilat Fayezov. He's the student that did most all of this work. Um, Vivek Modi did all of the early classification of kinases. Um, I'm on Twitter and also now Blue Sky, which I think is a better place than Twitter. Um, and I talk about structural bioinformatics. I rant about people parking in bike lanes. Um, I have an argument with a Nobel Prize winner about bad COVID takes. Um, and I talk about LGBTQ issues in science. Um, and so with that, I will stop and answer any questions. So if you have any questions, just put it in the Q&A. Uh, so I guess we have the first one from K. Uh, so the first one is, is the K, is the activation or deactivation states really shared across, uh, shared all around the kinases? Right. I think, I think the, 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 for a active kinases, you would expect it to be shared or, or, you know, pretty much all kinases have to have the same active form around the active site. And, you know, they have to bind a substrate. So there has to be a groove where the substrate fits. Um, they have to bind ATP. And so we, we're pretty confident about the criteria around the active site for the active structures. Inactive structures are different. It seems tyrosine kinases, for instance, Quite a few of them have a kind of folded up activation loop that's DFG out, makes a little beta sheet strand and a turn and then another strand. Um, and then a tyrosine um, in that uh, beta sheet uh, makes a hydrogen bond with the HRD motif. So it's sort of auto inhibited like a substrate, a pseudo substrate. Um, but that's not all tyrosine kinases. And you can get alpha fold to do that to most tyrosine kinases, but you look at the PDB, look at FGFR structures, and there are hundreds of them and none of them have that that motif, that structure. And yet I can force AlphaFold to make that structure. I don't know what that means. I don't know that means, you know, we're 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 making a fake structure and that's not really what FGFR looks like, or just nobody's done a PDB structure with that FGFR structure. Um, AGC kinases, for instance, don't really have inactive forms. All of the structures in the, almost all the structures in the PDB look active. They are regulated in a different way. So if you look across the kind of they do not share inactive structures across the kinome. Certain subfamilies share some inactive forms, but but it's actually really a complicated problem. I don't think we know the answer. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, by looking at the kinases, can we predict how other enzymes, let's say phosphatases, for instance, will behave in similar situations? I think that would be really interesting to look at, to look at different enzymes to see if they have you know, kind of clustered conformations of loops in their active sites. I'm sure people have, you know, one family at a time. Um, but I think we could do the same procedure where we get an idea of what they look like in the PDB, what's active, what's inactive, and then apply that to AlphaFold as templates um, and apply it to AlphaFold as models to try to get try to get two different states. That would be fun. Uh, 
Uh, next question from Carol is, uh, so when kinase inhibitors developed in active form should be a better target. I, most, I think most kinase inhibitors are targeted at inactive structures, but not all of them. Uh, and you know, if the kinase is in an active state most of the time in cells, it was some kinases are like that, then you would really only want to target the, the active form. Like AKT1 is really, you know, just active or PKA, let's use PKA as an example. Um, it's really only active in the in the PDB um, and probably only active in cells and is regulated has regulatory subunits is, and and uh, PKI is an inhibitor protein for PKA that, that Susan Taylor has studied. So not every kinase really has an inactive form and we don't know which ones have stable, you know, inactive forms that you would see in cells that you would want to target in the inactive form and which ones don't. So that's an open question. More questions um, from Raymond Hackett. Some ATPases are only active as dimers um, or large multi-domain complex. Is there something similar in kinases? Yes, there is. Um, some kinases uh, are activated by dimerization like BRAF. Um, and we're actually doing a study where we're trying to make homodimers of all of the kinases and see which, but with alpha-fold, alpha-fold multimer, and see which ones get good scores, which ones is alpha-fold um, strongly wants to make a dimer. Um, and there's some really interesting cases where it makes dimers for like a small family of kinases. And you look in crystals of the, in the PDB of those kinases and the same dimer is present. So we one, for example, um, and yet none of the we one structures are actually annotated as homodimers. And as far as I know, nobody talks about we one homodimer um, as a, you know, an active or inactive form of we one. And yet alpha fold reproduces the crystal dimer. And it didn't copy it because it, it isn't it wasn't trained on that we one dimer because nobody seems to think it's biological. Um, but there is a close family member where there is experimental data that that dimer is biological. It's the same dimer. So yes, dimerization is definitely important um, in in the activity of kinases. Uh, let's see from Basilis. Would it be possible to use the kinase criteria to uncover other kinase like enzymes based on different folds? Uh, there, there could be. Uh, uh, Janet Thornton, for instance, looks at active sites and looks at kind of convergent evolution of active sites, the residues that are necessary for an active site. Um, and so one could use something like that across the AlphaFold database to see, are there, are there proteins that we didn't know were kinases and actually turn out to be kinases? That would be interesting to do. Uh, Mary Navani, what do you think is the role of disordered regions like a unique domain of SART, um, interaction with substrate regulation or activation? Um, all of those things. Um, we have a set of the sequences of kinases from alpha, all the alpha fold models. I looked at all of them really carefully and found all of the tails, the C terminal tails, N terminal tails, adjacent domains that interact with the kinase domain. And so we're using those sequences to make models of all of the kinases that are longer, that are not just the kinase domain, but adjacent things that you know really regulate or really interact with the kinase domain. And I think they do all sorts of things. They block the activation loop, they regulate, they interact with other proteins, they get phosphorylated and, you know, fall off and it might, might make the kinase active or inactive. Um, so yeah, there's lots of interactions of other domains. Um, and then for Mark, um, is this application other organisms or structure? Um, certainly all the kinases in, you know, in mammals and, and even just higher eukaryotes are very closely related and this would work just as well for uh, non-human uh, non-human kinases, non-human uh, proteins. Okay. So if uh, if that's all, uh, I just had one last thing. So like you put up like five criteria for the active kinases. Uh, so how important is it to have all five criteria for it to be an actual active kinase? Because like you showed in the PDB that if you put different criteria, you get different percentages of PDB structures having that criteria. So is I think all five criteria are necessary to get an active kinase. That is to, to have room for the substrate and ATP and bind it properly. Um, you need to have all five criteria. If we apply all five criteria to structures in the PDB, some kinases still have a, some of them, all the structures look absolutely identical and they're all within one extra RMSD. Some others have a couple different populations. I've picked out ones that I think that one looks active and that other one doesn't. But some of them still have some diversity in the outer parts of the activation loop, even passing all five of our criteria. And I don't know what that means. I don't know if they're all active and they're just 
you know, an ensemble of active structures or whether some of them are maybe a little bit less active and, you know, they wouldn't bind substrate properly. Um, we, we don't know that yet, but there is still some diversity left even after applying our criteria. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'd like to thank Roland for his lovely talk. And next we have Michael Stump. Uh, uh, Michael, if you could like start the screen share, I'd just give an introduction like to see if it's... So uh, Michael Stumpf is a system biology professor at university at Melbourne in the integrative genomics uh, at University of Melbourne. Uh, he develops statistical models for biology, molecular uh, networks, and send modeling. So he finished his PhD from uh, University of Oxford in physics. Uh, after that, he joined uh, Imperial College London, where he formed his group in 2003. He has been awarded the Embo Young Investigator Award along with a lot of other awards. Uh, he moved to uh, uh, Melbourne in 2018. Today, he will be talking about his recent work on topological properties of protein universe. So over to you, Michael. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. I am not normally a structural biologist, but mostly interested in applying and finding new mathematical methods to describe cellular complexity but we couldn't resist the temptation to apply some of the tools to this fantastic data resource that Alpha Folders provided us with. And I will take you to some of our findings here. So the work was carried out by Christian Matzen and Agnese Babenzi. So Agnese is now a lecturer in mathematics at the University of Queensland. Christian is still a PhD student here in the group. And they have sort of complemented their strengths in bioinformatics and topology, respectively. But a whole lot of other people, Stephen Jang, Lucy Ham, Alessia David at Imperial, Douglas Pierce here at Melbourne contributed. And we were lucky enough to get funding by various funding bodies, including some free compute time and Oracle Research Clouds. I also want to acknowledge, because it's, it's a very good and healthy tradition here, the traditional owners on the land on which I live and work, which in my case are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who were the traditional owners of the land on which we now have Melbourne, and I pay my respect to the elders past and present. And I also like to thank them for providing this introduction slide, because European and, and Indian astronomy has largely progressed by looking at the stars. First Nation Australian Aboriginal astronomy looked at the dark spaces and what we call the Milky Way is sometimes in Aboriginal uh, history referred to as the dark emu. And they looked really at things such as the coal sack to define the shape of, of constellations. And I'm going to do pretty much the same thing today. I really don't care about the structure of proteins. I care about the holes and the voids that they create. And I take this by analogy to pasta, which we all like and know. And it's sort of my favorite sort of illustration of, of topology because we're not looking at the geometry of pasta, fantastic book, by the way, but the topology of pasta. And so what we are trying to do is we're now trying to count the number of holes that a structure has. And we find that all these different types of pasta here have zero holes. So there's just no way that you would find, you would be able to, to push anything through this pasta without really damaging it. This type of pasta here, and that includes rigatoni, penne, what have you not, they all have at least one hole. So topologically they're equivalent and very, very different from these zero hole pasta types. And that pretty much sorts most of it out, but my son's favorite type of pasta has six holes. So there's no way you can transform this shape here into any of the other shapes without cutting or, or gluing things together. But through simple twisting, turning and, and pulling, there's no way to turn any of those topology classes into one another. And so we essentially have a handle on on these types of pasta until something like the ravioli comes along, which is a different fish altogether, but also relevant for the talk because it has a void, not a single hole. And I will just classify things in terms of first order topological features, vo uh, loops, and second order topological features, voids that are sort of encompassed in 3D space. And I will take you through our analysis of alpha fold. So this really has changed how many of my colleagues like to do computational biology by reference to this vast data set of 240 million protein structures. And for us, the interesting question was, how do we make sense? How do we tame this complexity? Is, can we write a tour guide based on topology for all these structures that are in this fantastic data resource? 
and we chose topology as our organizing principle. The question of how to make sense of this data is, is a profound one. And Janet Thornton and colleagues were one of the first to write as a review about how this will likely transform much of computational biology. And they refer to some structures here, phosphatidine and phosphatase as the good. Human insulin, the predicted structure is the bad. And uh, with this E3 ubiquitin protein ligase is the ugly. So if you really go one by one through these 240 million structures, you'll find some that are really conforming to what we know. They conform to what is in PDB by definition, because that was the training input. But others, you think that doesn't look like a real protein. It's not a meaningful structure for protein that we like. So you can go through these structures one by one, try to make some sense. Other colleagues, so Tang et al. Uh, from Kuniko Kaneko's group have tried to make sense of the structure in a sort of organism level, try to see if organismic complexity corresponds to some simple measure. For example, here on the left-hand side to the radius of gyration for roughly equally long proteins. And they looked at protein chain lengths and complexity as captured by the radius of gyration for, them, for, for, for these protein structure predictions. So we are taking this other type of approach and it's largely based on, on sort of a sort of quasi-philosophical question, what is better? Do you want to have large amounts of data with medium or acceptable quality, or do you want to look at high quality data, but very small data sets? So this trade-off between the quantity and the quality that we want to look off is something that concerns us a lot in our day-to-day -day work. But we can start by agreeing that our analysis should not really destroy the signal that's in the data. And that's what we try to set out to do by taking this very coarse grain perspective that the topological lens affords us with. But I'm going to use a concept called homology and the definition of homology in mathematics is very different from the one that you all will be familiar with. So the mathematical definition of homology is an association between a sequence of algebraic objects with something that is a topological space. In more normal words, it's a relationship between something discrete and something continuous. And if I have three points in space, they are some distance apart and I would like to learn some relationship from them. I can do this in a number of ways. What we are using is called persistent homology. So we are slowly growing a radius around each of those points until the point, the radius, the, the circles start to overlap. If that happens, we say from this radius onward, we have an interaction between the two dots on the left hand side. We let the circles grow further until we have another touching set of circles. And we now know that the node here and here interact, so we draw an edge between them here. And we can go further and grow this further until we now have all three circles are overlapping and we can draw the final third edge between them. And we can look at either the three edges or if we just try to go deeper into the mathematical tool set, we can now treat this as what's called a, a simplex in, uh, that has, has three sides to it. And so we are using these types of relationships that link on the left-hand side, something in real space with a graph structure. In our case, we use a hypergraph structure in discrete space. So this is what we use when we talk about homology. So we are taking now vertices in space and we plot here, when do we first see such a structure? When do the structure becomes obliterated by a higher order dimensional sort of simplex? And we draw this persistent diagram. And from this persistent diagram, we're trying to influence, to identify those structures, substructures that are most likely to drive the overall structure that we see in the data here. So we're going from something very coarse grained to something more mathematically amenable. And then we try to see what determines the overall structure. But the advantage that we have is we don't have to pose any sort of outside constraints on how we define these structures. So we just really let the data guide us. So we have to go through this process some 214 million times, and that is doable, but it's not computationally cheap. 
the advantage that our approach has, and in the preprint we go to some length trying to make this uh, robust, is that topology is really robust to noise. So in particular, those regions in alpha fold that correspond to low confidence regions never contain the types of things that we would call topology generators. So they're topologically, and in our view, therefore quite boring. Because we have to do this so a lot, Christian spent an awful lot of time benchmarking different algorithms, making sure we have the fastest possible approach and we can do this with finite amounts of memory. And what initially struck us as a two and a half year job on 160 CPUs in the end through optimization using Julia rather than Python or, or, or other sort of languages made it possible to do this in less than three days. Plus, on top of that, we did some robustness analysis. So this was really possible because of, of his determination to make this fit into very comfortably into the first year of his PhD. So what we are doing in practice is we take the alpha fold predictions. We use the backbone carbon alpha atom. And we place a point in 3D space to create a point cloud. So this is the translation from the alpha fold prediction into a point cloud. From this point cloud, we calculate the persistence diagram that corresponds to these structures. And we then map these persistent features back onto the protein structure and identify those sequence, those structural elements that really drive the 3D structure. We look at loops, those would be the holes in pasta, and we look at the voids, which would be these sort of confined points in, in three-dimensional space, like the ravioli that I showed before. And then for each point in the protein, we can calculate something, the topological influence scores, that is a measure for how often a given residue is involved in a feature that drives the overall topology of these proteins. And we do this for all 240 million proteins. Here, Christian and Agnese have provided a sort of overview over the different kingdoms that we had. We look at bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. We find, we, we were particularly interested at a couple of model organisms that the group is looking at anyway. So E. coli, but sort of satellites. Of course, Cerebisia and humans we looked at, and we tried to identify what type of species in the alpha fold prediction are diverse or rich in terms of topology. And the richest species, and I wouldn't read too much into this, is down here. That's the cheetah. So there's no particular reason why this should be very rich. But we then looked in more detail at what we find here in the in, among the mammalians, the humans, and we find humans, and the color code is here, but it's much, much clearer in the paper, in the preprint. Humans are actually topologically not as rich as many of the other mammals. And that suggests that we have different levels of organization that give complexity to humans over other organisms. But it's, uh, it's for us, it was only a starting point trying to see, can we learn something from this? But overall, it's a, it, it starts to give an idea that the topological complexity alone does not drive the complexity of an organism in the sort of conventional, oh. So can you see it now again? Sorry. Uh, so, uh, sorry, but I'm not quite sure what happened there. So the, top, so the m mammals are, the uh, so humans are one of the less diverse species, cheetah, the by far the most diverse species that we have in our data set among the mammals. But there we go. So now we're trying to see what else do we find in our sorry, in our data. And we perform a couple of sanity checks. The first thing we did is try to see if topological features that we identify are linked to something which structural biologists have studied for a long time, particular cath domains, other domain definitions. And we find that by and large, the clusters that topological measures assign correspond very nicely with domains in, in cath and other databases, but potentially find a little bit. So fairly frequently you find that a traditional cath domain would correspond to more than one topological cluster, 
but in a way which, for example, highlighted here is, is not outrageous. So you wouldn't be surprised if somebody were to tell you this. And we can quantify this by the homogeneity score, but more or less we find very good agreement between traditional domain annotations and the domains that are purely defined in terms of topological features. What we also found when looking at the mechanism and catalytic site atlas is that topology defines voids in the protein structure that are co-located with active sites or with protein binding sites. So they tend to be closer to the boundary of a void than you would expect to occur by chance. So this is something which we also think is reflecting some baseline sanity of our approach. And we found that the topology of alpha fold proteins is highly correlated with that of experimentally available structures. Again, this is not so surprising because those structures clearly fed into the alpha fold algorithm, but by and large, this means that we can now focus on the analysis of alpha fold and not have to always explicitly go back to PDP or other structures for our purposes. Then we start to think about what other aspects of biology might be interesting. And we hit upon two facts that we found were reasonably unexpected and news and, and for, for us new. And the first one was we looked at the topological features in mesophiles, such E. coli and in thermophiles, I'm trying to see is there a difference in the structure and the size and other characteristics of the voids that we have in these organisms. And we find for clearly defined unambiguous orthologs that in the majority of cases, smaller voids are overrepresented among the thermophiles compared to mesophiles. So you see here that very small voids are uh, more common in mesophiles, in thermophiles than in mesophiles. Larger voids are more common in mesophiles than in thermophiles. And that is something which we found across all the molecules that we looked at, but also across individual, in each individual enzyme class, uh, EC classes, we try to see, do we see a consistent pattern in, in different EC categories? And we also were able to rule out that the differences in void size are caused by the volume of different amino acids. So you see that in these voids, they're pretty much distributed as equally as you would expect to occur in these circumstances. So this is something which-, uh, which Michael, we sorry, hello. Yes? Uh, we can't yeah. hear you. Oh. Uh, now it's okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when did I when, when did that when did I drop out? Uh, when you were talking about the void sizes, uh, depending on the amino acids. Okay, so okay, that's oh, you haven't missed that much. Then that's good. So yeah, um, so the, we we find that the amino acids are equally represented among in the voids in thermophiles and mesophiles. There's no secular difference in the amino acid composition. Something we were very keen to rule out. The other thing that we were looking at, and that is one of the few situations where so a first guess was borne out by more detailed statistical analysis, was trying to see if mutations where we have a good idea if they're neutral or damaging, if they correspond to topological features. Our first two examples were ACE2 and HBB, and we tried to see are there what's the topological inference score, some measure of the topological importance for mutations that are neutral versus mutations that are damaging. And we found in both our first examples that the spectrum of the damaging mutations is shifted towards higher topological influence scores compared to neutral. And we found the same thing for both proteins. What surprised me and caused me a sort of slightly sleepless night while I was waiting for the results is that also is the case if you look at all the proteins that are in this database, MISSENSE 3D, that was created by Alessia David at Imperial College and my former colleague, Mike Sternberg. And so you really find that the topological influence score, our measure of how important in a topological sense a residue is, does 
seem to chime with 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 baseline intuition that you have that those sites that are important in shaping the topology or the structure of the, of the protein measured by topology are enriched for for mutations that have some deleterious effect or some structural effect and we looked at them separately and and in combination and we're going through this in some detail in the paper and so what you see is here that if you look at a, a measure of the importance in this case we use a centrality in the hypergraph that represents our topolo topological analysis is we find that damaging mutations are associated with high higher topological centrality compared to the green mutations, which are which are neutral to all intents and purposes and what we know. So what we are fairly confident about now is that topology is able to capture hallmarks of protein organization that is independent of the sequence. So we look the topology without any reference to the primary sequence. We only looked at sequence later on if you were to try to get some sort of statistical insight into, into overall patterns. And so this is measured by, in our mind, by, by a few things. First of all, we find there is a nice correlation with protein domain annotations and the position of active sites, catalytic sites, binding sites, as tabulated in, in, in high quality data sets. To our sort of uh, delight, we found that topology shows some secular differences between organisms that are adapted to different temperatures. So in the in sense that a protein, an organism that prefers to live at higher temperature, tends to be less determined by large voids. It seems to be sticking slightly more closer together. The voids, the internal voids, are smaller by... Uh, some significant margin compared to the mesophilic uh, orthologs. And mutations with deleterious and or structural effects are overrepresented in these topology generators that we can identify using this approach. So what we set out to do is we're really trying to see if topology makes sense and topology is really, until very recently, was a branch of pure mathematics, not at all applied mathematics. But it has some gained some traction in topological data analysis, for example, but also with the approaches that we've made available can be applied to so structured data. It includes a 3D structured data of proteins or, or other long molecules. And we would argue now, so my group and I would argue that topology can act as a guiding principle or as a tour guide to make sense of certain sections of this vast amount of data that is contained alpha fold. So if you want to look and check the data and the analysis tools, please feel free to look at, at, at this GitHub website. It's also referenced in the paper, the papers on bioarchive. And we would love to hear from people with uh, problems, criticisms, or suggestions that they have for this paper, for this methodology. And I want to conclude with this. So we already have a few Q&A there. So yeah, if, if you look at it, uh, have you tested whether how well our organisms described in AlphaFold influence your organism specific results? Example via Busco score? Uh, so let me let me have a look if I can see this. I have to find my uh, my cursor. So oh uh, yes, we've we've tested some of that. It's um, it's it was really hard to identify comparable orthologs. We had to filter quite hard to make sure that we don't introduce some bias by looking at longer proteins in one circumstance compared to others. So uh, we found once we done that filtering, there was no organism specific effect that we could identify beyond the ones that we were interested in when we looked at, at, at the mesophile versus 
uh, thermophile. Yes, I, I, is, I hope that answers the question. The next by Vasilis is, that's that's a very good point. So could the diversity in topological complexity be attributed to artifacts caused by lower quality of gene annotations, gene prediction in non-model species? We write about this a lot. And we looked a lot at proteins. So, so we looked at, pro we filtered proteins by different ways. So we looked at the reliability or the confidence scores that alpha fold assigns. And we found that all the regions that are not assigned a structure that is at all reliable never generate a topolo topology generator. So that would be stuff that is missed entirely from alpha fold but it's so if alpha fold is unable to predict it it would we would miss it but it would not it itself bias our analysis i hope that makes sense and and carol so that seems to be the same question so i hope that has now jointly answered this oh so the point clouds what needy asked the point clouds are the 3d positions of, of the carbon alpha backbone atoms that we used to represent. We, we could have, we chose other things as well to compare, but that was our baseline to identify the a mapping from the 3D structure into a point cloud. The next question is topological analysis applicable to analyzing protein structural ensembles? Yes. And you, there is work going on, on making sure that we can identify this, we can define very nice distances between the topological structures, the features that we have, or the hypergraphs that we use to represent them. And with that, you can you can you can do this analysis. Our domains defined by topology are not necessarily so, so in sequence space correct. Can you class the domains at the scale of uh, what Raymond Hackett asked, our domains as defined by topology are not necessarily continuous in sequence space, correct? Um, it's, it, it, it's something which we write about a lot. More often than not, when we looked at it, in sequence, there was still a distinction in sequence space as well, but they just... Uh, they were inherited together always in, in the CATH database. But in our analysis, we were able to identify different topological constituents. So they, you would never see them separate. But from a purely structural point of view, it makes sense to, to say there is a there is a difference. How, so I hope that goes somewhere to answering this. Mariana Watney says, how sensitive are the topological features to a conformational state of the protein? Have you tried to run a different conformations of the same protein? Yes, we have. And we used a very slow folding protein in, in one of the in, uh, in the paper and tried to see if the um, topology generators, correspond to those regions that are involved in the protein folding process. That's not quite the same as what you are after, I feel, but it's it's the closest that we, we try to get to find some good data that allows us to test some changes in conformational space. How the mutations over represent topology like the side change or the surface behavior change or something else. Um, so we don't tend to identify topological features in the side chains. So that's where I said we would, if you have an ensemble of protein structures, we would get an ensemble of topologies. And we have worked very hard, and that will be a different preprint, but in, in, a, in a very, very dry mathematical tone. So I, I would not recommend this necessarily to as, as a first introduction on trying to identify useful actionable distances between topological features which, which were have not been around and so once we have that we can start to see if the let's say if the if the distribution of distances among the structural ensemble 
is at all relatable to the distances between the topological ensemble. I hope that goes towards answering Vasily's question. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a really good one, difficult one. Gonza has asked, have you analyzed uh, topology in cryophiles as well? Do they show the opposite trends compared to thermophiles? Uh, also, we, we didn't, <laughs> yes, uh, we didn't have enough data on cyclophiles. Okay. So okay. it's, uh, we, we, and I decided not to look because I think we only, we had very few that were really comparable. So it made, it would have been anecdotal. Mm -hmm.